good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to the monthly clinical meeting of the sri lanka medical association and today it's in collaboration with the sri lanka college of hematologists on the topic of paroxysms of dark urine approach to diagnosis and management i am dr sarath gamdi sillo on behalf of the sri lanka medical association we have got three young clinical hematologists for today's session um it be dr omega vikram singh a clinical hematologist from the teaching hospital kurunagala uh, then it will be dr mindya neelavathura bandara clinical hematologist from the base hospital gampala teaching hospital and thirdly for the picture quiz it will be dr tamudika vitanage a clinical hematologist of base hospital panadur uh each one will make a presentation for 20 minutes and at the end of the three presentations there will be time for questions and answers uh may we start with uh, dr omega vikram singh huh? on uh, clinical cases and discussion by her dr omega Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Omega Vikram Singh, uh, acting consultant clinical hematologist from Teaching Hospital Kunuragada. Um, first of all, uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Hematologists, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for providing us this opportunity to share the hematology knowledge. So we will be discussing the topic paroxysms of dark urine approach to diagnosis and management and I will be presenting the first case. Uh, the history goes back to 2015 where my patient was a 27 year old previously healthy male working as a seaman. He presented with symptoms of anemia which required infrequent blood transfusions and thrombocytopenia. So he had no fever or constitutional symptoms, no bleeding manifestations were observed, uh, no comorbidities. He was not on any uh, long-term drugs. He was consuming a non-vegetarian average Sri Lankan diet. He's married, a father of one child, and denied any risky sexual behaviors. So his peripheral cytopenia was further investigated, including a bone marrow biopsy. And the marrow revealed hypocellular bone marrow with trilineage dysplasia. So the hypoplastic MDS was the probable diagnosis at this stage. Further investigations, including MDS cytogenesis, were not done due to unaffordability. Therefore, risk stratification was not done. He was managed with red cell transfusions as a low risk MDS. Few weeks later, he was admitted with sudden onset right-sided weakness of the body, weakness of the leg, and the CT revealed acute venous infarction of the left parietal cortex with a suspicious filling defect in the superior sagittal sinus, suggestive of venous sinus thrombosis. After a few days, he was complaining of passing dark-colored urine. Therefore, he was further investigated. His full blood count revealed moderate anemia with HP of 6.4, macrocytosis, and low normal white cell count with mild neutropenia and moderate thrombocytopenia. Blood picture revealed normochromic normocytic red cells with numerous polychromatic cells, which I have highlighted using a red arrow in the top picture. There was low normal white cell count with mild neutropenia. There were occasional dysplastic neutrophils as well, which I have highlighted using a red arrow in the bottom picture. And there was moderate thrombocytopenia. No platelets comes noticed. Direct antiglobulin test was negative. 
and the hemolytic screening revealed indirect hyperbilirubinemia, reticulocytosis, and high LDH. His urine for hemoglobin was positive using spectrophotometry. Liver and renal functions were normal. Viral serology, including hepatitis B, C, HIV, and CMV were negative. ANA was negative. An ultrasound scan revealed no splenomegaly, and he was high and repeated. So in summary, he had neg that negative non-spirocytic hemolytic anemia, hemoglobinuria suggestive of intravascular hemolysis, and at the same time, he had peripheral cytopenia and thrombosis. Therefore, the diagnosis of PN, the PNH was considered. Then uh, he was screened for PNH using urine for hemosiderine for three consecutive days and ham test, which became as positive. Therefore, he was referred to MRI Colombo for PNH flow cytometry. And the peripheral blood flow cytometry showed um, GPI-linked antigen absent uh, PNH clones in red cells, uh, granulocytes, and monocyte. Therefore, the diagnosis was confirmed. So he was treated with transfusions, anticoagulated with uh, low molecular heparin followed by warfarin for the thrombosis and physiotherapy. He was started on folate supplements uh, because of ongoing hemolysis. The complement blockers was not available in Sri Lanka. Therefore, the physiotherapy was continued with best supportive care. After some time, he recovered completely from his weakness. On further follow-up, he complained of passing frothy urine and was found to have nephrotic range proteinuria and was referred to nephrologist. There he underwent a renal biopsy, which revealed minimal change glomerular nephritis with severe proximal tubular siderosis due to chronic intravascular hemolysis, which I have shown using a black arrow, the blue color hemosiderine deposits using pearl stain. For that, he was started with prednisolone and tacrolimus by nephrologist. At the moment, he is receiving anticoagulation, infrequent transfusions, and immune suppressive therapy, and is following under hematology and nephrology care. Moving to the discussion, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH. So what is meant by PNH? Paroxysmal means sudden and transient. Nocturnal refers to believe that the cell break happens mostly at night because one known reason these patients pass dark colored urine, especially in the mornings. So the hemoglobinuria means that hemoglobin is in the urine. But the PNH is an inaccurate name because PNH is neither paroxysmal nor nocturnal and hemolysis happen constantly. It does not occur only at night and hemoglobinuria is seen in only minority of patients. It's a rare acquired stem cell disorder in which red blood cells are destructed prematurely within the blood vessels. It has fascinated hematologists since its first definitive description in 1882 by Paul Strobing. The defect is intrinsic to the red cell which, in which there is an acquired genetic mutation in the pig A gene, which is critical for the biosynthesis of glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, we commonly refer to as GPI structures. Few facts about PNH. Since it's, rare, since it's a rare disease, clinical research and drug development has become difficult. Uh, and it is not known how many people are affected from PNH worldwide exactly, but it is estimated that 4,000 to 6,000 people in US are diagnosed with PNH. Both genders are affected equally. PNH can occur at any age, but frequently found in young adults and it's rare in children. Now, these GPI deficient clones only expand if there is an additional factor that encourages their selection, likely a T cell mediated immune response, somewhat similar that we see in aplastic anemia. Now, 
PNH has associated bo associated bone marrow failures. This suggests that such bone marrow failure syndrome are permissive for the expansion of these PNH clones. These clones are detectable in up to 50% of patients with aplastic anemia and a small proportion of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome, including hypoplastic MDS. The picture illustrates how this overlap has occurred. You can see there's a proportion of patients with overlapping features. Leukemic transformation is rare. Uh, it has been shown that less than 5% of PNH patients in large series have developed AML. Bit about pathophysiology of PNH. Now, under normal circumstances, the complement mediated lysis of red blood cells is prevented by uh, GPI anchored protein CD55 and 59 on red blood cells. When there is a mutation in the pig gay gene, it leads to uh, reduced biosynthesis or so absent of GPI protein, which invariably result in deficiency of GPI anchored structures like CD55 and CD59. Therefore, PNH blood cells are extremely susceptible to destruction by complements. Now the clinical picture, there's a clinical trial hemoglobinuria due to intravascular hemolysis, thrombosis, and acquired bone marrow failure. The clinical picture in PNH is dependent on the balance between these three components. Intense chronic intravascular hemolysis characterized by episodes of hemoglobinuria is the hallmark of PNH. The degree of hemolysis is associated with the size of PNH clone, particularly the type, uh, type 3 PNH cells with complete deficiency. Now, this episodic hemoglobinuria is frequently associated with disabling symptoms like profound lethargy, which is, which is disproportionate to the degree of anemia, abdominal pain, sometimes severe and requiring opiates, dysphagia and erectile dysfunction. Many of these symptoms and complications of PNH results directly from intravascular hemolysis, uh, resulting depletion of nitrous oxide, which is, the which is the main chemical mediator, which important in smooth muscle relaxation. When there is intense intravascular hemolysis, more and more hemoglobin will be released in the circulation, which will bind with nitrous oxide and remove nitric oxide from the circulation, which will result in smooth muscle dysfunction, vasoconstriction, pulmonary and systemic hypertension, and possibly thrombosis, which are all classic symptoms of PNH. Now, the bone marrow failure in PNH, the degree of anemia and other cytopenia is a composite of the activity of intravascular hemolysis as well as the degree of underlying marrow failure. The platelet count in many patients is suitable surrogate for marrow function unless if there is a hyperspenism following a hepatic vein thrombosis or Bocciari syndrome where there is spenomegaly and hyperspenism contributing to thrombocytopenia. Thrombosis in PNH, Thrombosis occurs in 40 to 50% of patients with hemolytic PNH with a predilection for certain veins like hepatic vein uh, and other splanchnic vein and cerebral veins. The classical clinical scenario is that of downward spiraling thrombotic events. What does it mean? It's, uh, that is after the first thrombosis, patient continue to experience further apparently discrete thrombosis despite adequate anticoagulation. The causes for thrombosis in PNH is multifactorial, including activation of PNH platelet, complement activation, intravascular hemolysis leading to nitrous oxide deficiency and endothelial dysfunction. Anticoagulants are relatively ineffective in preventing this circle of catastrophic thrombosis as they do not stop complement activation. 
but complement blockers usually interrupt this vicious cycle of thrombosis. Few words about renal involvement in PNH. All patients with hemolytic PNH develop heavy renal tubular iron loading and eventually develop chronic renal failure with a minority progressing to establish chronic renal failure requiring dialysis. Now the Canadian PNH network has proposed a set of criteria with a mnemonic using a mnemonic called catch criteria to facilitate easy identification of patients who required screening for PNH. Uh, in CATCH criteria, uh, C stands for unexplained cytopenias, A for aplastic anemia or history of aplastic anemia, T for unexplained thrombosis, C for Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, and H for hemoglobinuria. So in broad, if one criteria is present, which cannot be explained otherwise, it is recommended to screen for these patients for PNH. And it is um, advised to look for other criteria as well because the presence of multiple criteria increase the likelihood of disease. Bit about uh, laboratory workup. As I mentioned during my case, the PNH workup should start with screening, which include HAM test or acidified serum lysis tests where we demonstrate exaggerated hemolysis when PNH red cells are added to acidified serum. Then we have to demonstrate positive hemosiderine in patients' urine using a PEARLS technique. Confirmation is done by PNH flow cytometry, where we demonstrate GPI anchor protein deficient populations of red blood cells or white blood cells or both. Here, we use a special technique called uh, flare-based flow cytometry in which there is a fluorescent label aerolysin reagent is used, which is um, avidly bind with uh, GPI proteins to identify GPI deficient white cells in patients' peripheral blood. So uh, the red cell analysis is um, affected by recent blood transfusion but the white cells are not. Therefore, it is recommended to maintain at least four to six weeks of transfusion-free period if there is no clinical risk. Now, this investigation is expensive and it will cost about 40,000 rupees if we get it done from outside, but it is available at the Hematology Department of Medical Research Institute, Colombo, for public patients. You can refer your patients through the hematologist of your institution or the nearest institution. Now, PNH is a disabling and life-threatening disease. It is usually progressive. Symptoms and disease progression vary greatly from one person to another. Quality of life is usually diminished in PNH. Therefore, early intervention is critical. Moving to the treatments, uh, it's no longer only blood and blood thinners. Treatment goals for PNH is to decrease the hemolysis and therefore reduce the risk of thrombosis and number of transfusions to improve the quality of life and to prevent end organ damage. Conventional management in PNH has been supportive, including transfusion support, hematinic therapy, uh, including folate supplements and iron replacement therapy for patients who are on iron deficient because with chronic intravascular hemolysis, patients tend to develop iron deficiency. Corticosteroids had been used as immune suppressive agent and analgesics to relieve pain episodes. Treatment of thrombosis in PNH. For the first episode, anticoagulation with heparin followed by warfarin for at least three months is recommended. But if it is a single episode and complement blockers are available, anticoagulation can be discontinued after three months, provided that the patient is being introduced a complement blocker. But for recurrent episode, lifelong anticoagulation is indicated. Warfarin is preferred, but low molecular weight heparin can be used. 
especially for pregnancy. There is limited data about efficacy of DOAC. Uh, bit about complement blockers. The complement inhibit inhibitors have revolutionized therapy of PNH. In 2007, FDA approved eculizumab as the treatment for PNH. And in 2018, it approved ravulizumab for treatment of PNH. Now, both of them are C5 inhibitors, which will uh, block C5 convertase and formation of membrane attacks complexes, therefore the red cell lysis. Eculizumab was the first drug to be approved for PNH. It does not cure PNH, but holds the breakdown of red blood cells, therefore reduce the risk of thrombosis and improves the overall quality of life. Phase three, Trials have demonstrated that it causes 86% reduction in hemolysis, 92% reduction in the need for transfusions, and 93% redu reduction in the thrombotic events, and 73% reduction in need for transfusion. There is significant reduction in the fatigue and improvement in overall quality of life. It does not treat PNH-associated bone marrow failure and may not completely restore HP because when patients are treated with eculizumab, the red cells will be, high, uh, will be heavily coated with C3, which will result in extravascular hemolysis at the liver and spleen. So the patients on eculizumab will still have extravascular hemolysis with suboptimal hemoglobin response. Because it's a complement blocker, it increases the risk of life-threatening meningitis. Therefore, it is recommended to vaccinate patients with meningococcal vaccine at least two weeks prior to the drug. It is given as an IV infusion, 600 milligram weekly for four weeks, followed by a maintenance dose of 900 milligram two weekly. Now this dose is usually adequate to um, create a complete uh, complement block, but approximately about 10% of patients, this standard dose is inadequate and they break through complement blockade. So some patient will experience episodes of hemolysis um, near, near to the next infusion. Ravulizumab, again, it's a C5 blocker, which has a similar structure and mechanism of action as eculizumab, but it has long half-life. Therefore, it can be given in every eight week. Bit about emerging and novel therapies for PNH, the C3 blocker, Pegsitacoplan, um, it's been tested for, uh, as a treatment mode for PNH for patients who are having continuing hemolysis with suboptimal hemoglobin response with eculizumab because C3 inhibitors will abolish both the intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. There are two other oral formulations, Danicopan, which is a um, factor D blocker, and iptocopan, a B blocker, are also being tested as a treatment, but these are not FDA approved yet. Role of hemopoietic stem cell transplant in PNH. Uh, only curative therapy for individuals with PNH is bone marrow transplant, but it is associated with high risk of morbidity and mortality. Therefore, typically it is reserved for individuals with serious complications like progressing bone marrow failure, life-threatening thrombosis, and for very young patients. In summary, PNH is a unique as an acquired hemolytic disorder, and the defect is intrinsic to the red cell. There is a clinical trial, and the clinical picture depends on the balance between three components, the intravascular hemolysis, thrombosis, and the bone marrow failure. Diagnosis is confirmed by PNH flow cytometry. 
and the conventional management has been supportive, including transfusions, hematonic therapy, um, and immune suppression. But anti-complement monoclonal antibodies, eculizumab and ravulizumab, significantly reduces the hemolysis, the underlying cause for morbidity and mortality in PNH. So these are my references. And thank you very much. That comprehensive description of PNH. Uh, we'll next have Dr. Bindya Nilavakura Bandara, uh, another case presentation on the same theme. Please. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome you all uh, to the second case presentation in monthly clinical meeting today. Uh, I'm Dr. Indyanilo Trabandara, consultant clinical hematologist, base hospital Gampala. So uh, my patient was a previously healthy 15 year old male patient. Uh, who was the younger son in a family of three children. Uh, he presented with intermittent high-grade fever for five days with productive cough for one week and uh, generalized malaise and lethargy for two, three days duration. He also complained of dark colored urine for two days associated with mild dysuria for one day. There were no other bleeding manifestations and he denied any skin rashes, arthralgia, or arthritis. He had developed a productive cough one week before and has taken medications from the general practitioner. And he had been uh, prescribed with some medications, including some antibiotics. There was no history of similar episodes in the past, and there was no history of urinary tract calculi. And the family hist history was not significant. On a physical examination, he was found to be febrile, and there was severe pallor and icterus, and shorty cervical lymph adenopathy was there, but none of the lymph nodes were uh, more than one centimeter in size. There was no hepatosplenomegaly, and a few uh, crepitations were heard uh, bilat in bilateral lungs. There was a grade one systolic murmur, and there, were, uh, there was no renal angle tenderness. Uh, just to summarize the history and the uh, physical findings, uh, it's a previously healthy 15 year old male patient presented with fever, dark colored urine and malaise for three days duration. On examination, he was severely pale and dicteric with no organomegaly. So at this point, what are the differential diagnoses that you can think of? So, um, Considering the fact that the patient was having uh, severe pallor and icterus, we thought of uh, hemolytic anemia as uh, our first differential diagnosis. And due to the presence of dark colored urine, we suspected it could be of intravascular origin. Uh, in addition, given with the history of taking medications, including antibiotics from the general practitioner, Along with fever, we thought, we suspected whether it could be G6PD deficiency in the patient and also paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, which is giving rise to intravascular hemolysis following infections was also another differential diagnosis for us. Uh, secondly, hepatitis infection was another uh, differential diagnosis considering the presence of uh, icterus fever and dark colored urine along with malaise. However, um, obviously pallor is not usually feature in hepatitis infection. Um, in the bottom of the list, a urinary tract infection and calculi was also there, but um, as you all know, pallor and icterus uh, are not features in urinary tract infection or calculi. 
So we uh, proceeded with the investigation and the full blood count revealed uh, mild neutrophil leukocytosis with um, severe anemia, which was HP was 48, along with a normal platelet count, which was 406. The PT and APTT was normal, and the retic count was 2.3, which was within the normal range. The liver transaminases were within normal ranges. However, serum bilirubin was elevated with indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, there was no normal total protein and serum albumin levels, and the serum creatinine was normal, and the CRP was mildly elevated with a value of 6.5. And the urine analysis showed positive uh, protein one plus, uh, but there was no red cells or pus cells, so we could uh, exclude hematuria in the patient. So um, since there was severe anemia along with indirect hyperbilirubinemia, we proceeded with rest of the hemolytic screening investigations, which showed LDH 2760, which was elevated, and the direct antiglobulin test that was three positive with three pluses, and urine for hemoglobin with uh, urinary spectrophotometry was positive, and the urine uh, hemosiderin urea was negative. Um, imaging studies with chest X-ray showed bilateral mild patchy opacities, and uh, the USS abdomen uh, excluded presence of hepatosplenomegaly or any intra-abdominal lymphadenopathy. <coughs> So uh, moving to the peripheral blood film findings, uh, the red blood cells were uh, normochromic, normocytic with presence of microspherocytes. There was moderate polychromasia, occasional in RBC, um, nucleated red blood cells, but there were no red cell agglutinations to suggest cold uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, or there were no bite cells, blister cells, or high bodies to suggest G6PD deficiency in the patient. Uh, white cells showed uh, mild neutrophil leukocytosis with toxic changes in neutrophils. And interestingly, there was erythrophagocytosis in the neutrophils. Um, I, I think you can appreciate the erythrophagocytosis in this neutrophil, which has engulfed a red, red blood cell uh, here, which is called erythrophagocytosis. And this neutrophil has engulfed two red cells. Um, so these are the microspherocytes um, and the polychromasia you can appreciate in the blood field. So uh, the com uh, conclusion of the blood field was given as the appearances are compatible with those of hemolysis. And the possibilities were the first one, paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, and secondly, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. <coughs> So um, we arranged the infective screening. The mycoplasma serology was negative. Hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis C, and HIV serology was negative. EBV, CME, IgM was negative, and the ANA was negative. So just to um, summarize once again with the clinical findings along with the lab investigation results, um, 15, it's a 15 years old male patient presented with CV anemia and John Dees with a respiratory tract infection uh, was found to have intravascular hemolysis, which is of immune origin. So what are the differential diagnoses at this point? So we could further narrow down the differential diagnosis into paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria and autoimmune hemolytic anemia cold type, because it's the type of uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia which gives rise to intravascular hemolysis. So the patient was further uh, evaluated with the following investigations. The Donald Landsteiner test was positive. DAT profile was arranged, which showed positivity with, for C3D with four pluses, and the IgG was negative. The cold agglutinin theta was done, which was less than two. So basically, it was intravascular hemolysis with erythrophagocytosis in blood film with positive Donald Landsteiner test. So we could come into the conclusion as a diagnosis paroxysmal called hemoglobinuria. So um, before uh, moving to paroxysmal called, paroxysmal called hemoglobinuria, I thought of uh, very briefly discuss uh, collectively 
uh, regarding autoimmune hemolytic anemias. Autoimmune hemolytic anemias, or IHAs, are caused by antibody production by the body against its own red cells. They are characterized by a positive DAT test, also known, known as Coombs test. Um, and IHAs can be divided into warm and cold types according to whether the antibody reacts more strongly with red cells at 37 degrees or at 4 degrees Celsius. So uh, this is the basic classification of IHA. Um, the uh, warm antibody usually gives rise to warm IHA. Uh, there are two types, of course, the primary and secondary warm IHA. Cold antibody uh, usually gives rise, gives rise to called hemagglutinin disease, which is the clonal um, called IHA and the called antibody syndrome, which usually happens uh, so in association with infections and um, certain lymphoproliferative disorders. Donald Landsteiner antibody uh, is the one which gives rise to paroxysmal called hemoglobin urea. Uh, warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias here. The, the red cells are coated with the immunoglobulin, uh, usually IgG alone, uh, with or without a complement. Uh, so the coated red cell is usually taken up by the reticular endothelial system in the spleen, giving rise to extravascular hemolysis. Uh, part of the coated membrane is lost, so the cell become progressively spherical, uh, more spherical, giving rise to spherocytes. Called autoimmune hemolytic anemias. In this syndrome, the, the antibody is IgM autoantibody, which attaches to red cells mainly in the peripheral circulation, where the temperature of the blood is cooler. Um, the antibody binds to red cell optimally at four degrees um, and fix complements. Um, called IHA usually give rise to, gives rise to intravascular and extra, extravascular hemolysis both. However, uh, intravascular hemolysis uh, most often predominates. So this diagram just to illustrate the uh, uh, differences between warm and cold IHA, uh, you can see the IgG antibodies that coat the red cells here. As a result, that becomes positive with IgG. And the IgG coated red cells are taken up by the reticular endothelial system. Uh, and the phagocytosed in the spleen, giving rise to extravascular hemolysis. In contrast, the red cells are coated with the pentamer IgM in cold IHA, uh, as well as with the complements, ultimately giving rise to membrane attack complex and in turn intravascular hemolysis. Partly, there is extravascular hemolysis as a result of phagocytosis of the complement bound red cell uh, in the liver. So this picture illustrates the difference between the blood films um, uh, of warm IHA versus cold IHA. Uh, you can appreciate the presence of spherocytes here in contrast to the presence of red cell agglutinations here. In addition, the common features of uh, uh, hemolysis include the, the, the polychromat uh, polychromatic cells and the nucleated red blood cells. So moving to the main topic, paroxysmal called hemoglobin urea. In PCH, the red cells are targeted by an autoantibody, which is called Donat Landsteiner antibody, which was first described by Julius Donat and Carl Landsteiner in 1904. And the PCH is one of the first clinical entities recognized as an autoimmune disorder. <coughs> the hallmark feature in a paroxysmal called hemoglobinuria is uh, formation of a polyclonal IgG antibody with the specificity for the P blood group antigen, which binds to red cells in the cold. However, the lysis of the red cell happens in warm conditions resulting in intravascular hemolysis. And this nature of the um, antibody is uh, described as being a, press, a biphasic antibody. So in low, low temperatures, the red cells get bound to the antibody IgG, and in at uh, 37 degrees, the intravascular hemolysis happens. So what are the infectious agents implicated in PCH? The viral causes include measles, mumps, CBV, CMV, varicella, zoster, influenza, and adenovirus. And the non-viral agents, agents include mycoplasma and hemophilus influenzae. 
A chronic relapsing PCH is classically associated with syphilis, as well as uh, some hematological malignancies, including non Hodgkin lymphomas and rarely myeloproliferative neoplasms. So, how do these patients with PCH present? Uh, they usually uh, present shortly after upper respiratory tract or GI infections, within minutes to hours of exposure to cold temperature, sudden onset back and abdominal pain, headache, leg cramps, fever, rigors, chills, nausea, vomiting, and esophageal spasms can happen. Obviously, they can present with pallor and icterus and hemoglobinuria. Oliguria and anuria can happen following acute renal failure. Cold dirty caria can happen due to release of uh, free hemoglobin into the circulation. Um, and although the disease may be fulminant at the onset, usually the acute form uh, follows a transient and a self-limiting cause. Chronic relapsing PCH manifests as episodic hemoglobinuria and anemic symptoms, uh, but it, it is usually milder than the acute form. Hepatosplenomegaly is not a usual feature in PCH. However, it can happen if there is an underlying lymphoproliferative or other neoplastic process. Um, while the classical syphilitic uh, PCH becomes infrequent these days, if, a, an, if an elderly patient presents with PCH, we need, uh, we need to always think of a paraneoplastic cause, such as an underlying hematological malignancy. So uh, this uh, picture illustrates very popular uh, clinical scenarios in Western countries, uh, which related to uh, uh, PCH. This is an elderly lady uh, who becomes unwell following doing Christmas shopping in the winter. And the next picture illustrates a boy who gets uh, red color urine after making a snowman um, outside in the Christmas. So the diagnostic considerations in PCH, the differential diagnosis include called hemagglutinin disease, drug-induced hemolysis, malaria, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and transfusion reactions. So all these differential diagnoses give rise to, um, these causes give rise to intravascular hemolysis. So what are the purposes of lab investigations that we carry out? Uh, firstly, to confirm the presence of intravascular hemolysis. Secondly, to establish the diagnosis of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, that is to prove the autoimmune nature of the hemolytic anemia. And thirdly, to identify other supporting features in hematopathological findings. So these are the eye investigations which would prove intravascular hemolysis. Um, serum free hemoglobin is elevated, LDH is elevated, and there will be um, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and the haptoglobulin level will be low, and hemoglobinuria will be there, and hemosiderinuria can happen in chronic cases. Reticular cytosis may not be apparent in the acute phase, as happened in our patient, or when there is a viral-induced myelosuppression. <coughs> Um, a donut Landsteiner test is a confirmatory test for PCH, which involves cooling of the patient's serum to four degrees uh, to allow the absorption of anti-P or to antibody steroid cells, followed by warming the tubes to 37 degrees, which would activate complement fixation and in turn hemolysis. So this diagram illustrates that uh, the patient, the two tubes which contain patient serums along with the P antigen positive red cells uh, are kept at zero to four degrees for 30 minutes, followed by um, 37 degrees for 60 minutes, which has given rise to intravascular, sorry, has given rise to hemolysis. So the same phenomenon is illustrated here. Uh, then the presence of marked erythrophagocyto erythrophagocytosis by neutrophil is a relatively rare observation in the blood film, but is a prominent feature in PCH. Um, as I, I described earlier, this is one of the uh, neutrophils which has engulfed a red cell. Uh, so it is called erythrophagocytosis. Um, and in addition, uh, the presence of microspherocytes. So these are the microspherocytes. 
and the nucleated red cells are indicative of intravascular hemolysis. So how should we manage a patient presenting with PCH? The mainstay of treatment of PCH is supportive care and avoidance of cold exposure. And the patients require hospitalization to monitor and treat complications associated with CV anemia secondary to massive hemolysis. Uh, during inpatient treatment, um, patient's cardiorespiratory function and hydration should be maintained and patients should be monitored uh, with the parameters of anemia and hemolysis including full blood count, LDH, retic count and the hemoglobin urea. And obviously the patient should be started on folic acid to help with the erythropoiesis. For life-threatening hemolysis and symptomatic anemia, transfusion of packed red cells through a blood warmer is required. Treat the, um, we need to treat the uncommon chronic form with red blood cell transfusions only when the CV exacerbations of hemolysis happens. Uh, there are some case reports uh, that describe um, a successful outcome in patients with PCH who had been treated with plasma exchange. Um, so uh, we should always look for a secondary causes in PCH and if found, they should be treated with that appropriate medical therapy. Hydration, alkalization of urine and other measures may be necessary to prevent kidney failure. So um, prevention of PCH in patients with chronic form of PCH, avoiding exposure to coal is essential to prevent recurrent episodes of hemolysis. So we are coming to the end of the presentation. Just to summarize it, uh, the PCH is a form of IHA, which is one of the most common cause of acute IHA in young children. In PCH, red cells are targeted by the biphasic donor clandestine antibody, most often triggered by infectious diseases or neoplasms. Diagnosis and management of PCH is challenging because it's a rare disorder and patient can become quite ill from intravascular hemolysis. Um, prompt and early identification and management is of utmost importance for a successful outcome in a patient with PCH. So these are my references. Thank you. Uh, next item, the last one, will be by Dr. Tamudika P. Bitanage, consultant hematologist in Panadura, and it will be a picture quiz. We'll see. And those on Zoom can give their answers on the WhatsApp. Correct? On the Zoom. Zoom. Yes, sorry. Good afternoon and thank you sir uh, for your kind introduction. So I'm going to discuss some MCQ questions because of the time limitations I won't be able to discuss much but I'll try to discuss at least seven eight questions right. Uh, so these are basically based on uh, morphology hematological morphology and this is going to be an interactive session so I expect you to actively participate those who are physically present and the Zoom participants can give their answers in the chat. Right, so moving on to uh, the first question. It's a 69 year old woman who presented to the rheumatology clinic with painful joints and morning stiffness. On examination, minor degree of cervical lymphadenopathy was there and palpable spleen tip on inspiration. And investigations wise, uh, she had a positive rheumatoid factor and the ESR was 54 while the, in the full blood count, WBC count was 94 uh, with HB of 83, platelet count 221 and neutrophil count was just 2.5 while lymphocytes were 91. This is her blood picture. So here are your options. What is the morphological diagnosis? Large granular lymphocytic leukemia. Who thinks this is large granular lymphocytic leukemia? 
Second dance is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. Right. And acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. Reactive lymphocytosis. Right. So most of the physical participants are, uh, have given the correct answer. So this is CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Why? Uh, because you can appreciate uh, the small mature type of lymphocytes here. And also these cells are called smudge cells because uh, of the fragility of the malignant cells, they get destroyed while preparing the slide. So smudge cells is not specific for CLL. But usually it is seen, numerous number of uh, sponge cells are seen in CLL also. So these cells are mature lymphocytes, small with a thin rim of cytoplasm. So this is CLL. Now, when you are reading the question, uh, this is a lady with the splenomegaly and rheumatoid factor positive uh, and uh, lymphocytosis. So one might wonder why this is not LGL, large granular lymphocytic leukemia. Probably the non-hematological trainees might wonder. So what does it look like? This is how the large granular lymphocytic leukemia looks like. Uh, if you see here, it has an abundant cytoplasm with granules and the cells are also large, somewhat larger than the chronic lymphocytic leukemia cells. So the answer is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, CLL. Moving on to the second question, a 60 year old Caucasian man presents with fatigue, nausea, abdominal discomfort, altered bowel function, insomnia, anxiety, and altered taste. He is a self-employed painter. Now, this is his blood picture. I am not sure whether this is very clear, the center cells, these types of cells were seen in the blood picture. And the bone marrow biopsy was done and the Prussian blue stain on the bone marrow aspirate was like this, with some bluish granules around the erythroblasts. Now the question is, what is the diagnosis? Raise your hands if you think it is lead poisoning, right? Myelodysplastic syndrome, thalassemia intermedia, primary sideroblastic anemia, right? So most of you are correct again, this is lead poisoning. Because in the history itself, you have all the features of lead poisoning, fatigue, nausea, and metallic taste of the mouth. And also it gives a clue here. He's a self-employed painter. So there's a clue that he might be using lead containing paint. And what are these? This is called basophilic stippling. Uh, these are the ribosome particles inside the cell, red cells. And in the bone marrow, because in lead poisoning, what happens is uh, due to the lead toxicity, heme synthetic pathway gets disrupted. Uh, there are several enzyme inhibitions in the heme synthetic pathway. So iron cannot be incorporated to form hemoglobin. So there is excess iron which gets deposited inside the erythroblasts and they will be stained with the Prussian blue stain. So these are called sideroblasts. So together with the history and these findings, the answer is lead poisoning. The other conditions here, myelodysplastic syndrome, thalassemia intermedia, primary sideroblastic anemia also might have these morphological manifestations, but with the clinical history, the most probable answer is the lead poisoning. Right, so moving on to the third question, a 23-year-old man with an epileptiform convulsion and fever was found to have deranged renal functions. 
This is his blood picture. I'll let you a moment to appreciate the findings there. Okay, there are two questions. We'll deal with both questions before discussion. First question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Rhabdomyolysis? Nobody thinks so. TTP? Mm -hmm. STEC-HUS, what is STEC-HUS? It is Shigella-like toxin producing E. coli HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Atypical HUS. Right. So the second question is, how would you confirm the diagnosis? Bone marrow aspirate. Adam tears 13 levels. Stool culture for Shigella dysentery. And platelet function studies. Right. Again, you've got it correct. Because this blood picture is a classical example of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. What you can see here are the fragmented red cells or the schistocytes, and you can see some spherocytes also. And all these uh, purplish, bluish, large cells are called polychromatic cells or the reticulocytes. And also the fourth phenomenon would be you can't appreciate any platelets in the blood picture. That's thrombocytopenia. And together with the clinical history, this is a man with epileptiform convulsions. So the answer would be TTP rather than HUS because in uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, convulsions are not that frequent. And how would you confirm the diagnosis? It is by RMTS 13 level assay. The fourth question, a 31-year-old woman had a history of elevated transaminases for several years but was not followed up. She is a non-alcoholic. She presents in liver failure and is found to be severely anemic. Eye examination revealed an annular discoloration around her cornea. This is her blood picture the lady who came with liver failure and severe anemia. And then we did a special stain on one of the blood pictures. And this is the new methylene blue stained blood film. So what is your diagnosis? Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Wilson's disease, G6PD deficiency, and Zeev syndrome. Right, yes. So it's Wilson's. This says she has had transaminases elevated for several years, and then she's non alcoholic. She comes with liver failure and there are cave rings around her cornea. So history itself gives that this is Wilson and then the blood picture. This is an example of an oxidative hemolytic hemolysis. So what you can see here are the white cells and blisters and some echinospherocytes. So these are the types of cells that you would see in oxidative hemolysis. And what are these stained with new methylene blue? Are the Heinz bodies, because Wilson's is an example for Heinz body hemolytic anemia, uh, similar to G6PD. So these uh, Heinz bodies are uh, oxidized denatured hemoglobin particles. So can it be G6PD deficiency? Well, if you look at the history, the KF rings are not likely in G6PD, and also this is a female patient. So 
the diagnosis is Wilson's disease. And in Sieb syndrome also, you won't get a oxidative hemolysis. You get a hemolysis in uh, uh, Sieb syndrome. And also there is uh, usually Sieb syndrome occurs in alcoholic patients, while our patient was non-alcoholic. Right, so most of you are correct. So the diagnosis is Wilson's disease. Question five. A 23-year-old man with fever and dyspnea was found to be pale and bruised. He was also found to have splenomegaly of two centimeters below the costal margin. Chest X-ray shows patchy shadowing of lungs. His WBC count was 92 while neutrophils 0.7 and lymphocytes 3.2. Hemoglobins 89 grams per liter. Platelets 41. This is the blood picture. What do you think the morphological diagnosis here is? AML, right? ALL, nobody. MDS, that is myelodysplastic syndrome, or whether this is changes due to severe sepsis. Right, yes, so this is AML. Why? These cells are blast cells. I don't know whether you can appreciate, but the, with the lighting and all, but the chromatin pattern here is very loose. Usually in immature cells, we will see the loose chromatin pattern. When the cells become mature, the uh, chromatin gets clumped so that you can see clumped chromatin. So this has loose chromatin pattern and obviously a large nucleus. And also I'm sure you can't appreciate, but I can in this uh, screen, there are nucleoli as well. And so this is obviously, this looks like AML, the main acute leukemia. And when you see these things, what are these called? These are R rods. So when you see R rods, your diagnosis becomes AML rather than AL. And together with the history of this young male who's with pancytopenia, uh, not obviously with the WBC, but the WBC count has gone up because of the blast cells. So it is AML. So what other tests would you like to do to confirm the diagnosis? Bone marrow aspirate, flow cytometry, cytogenetics and molecular genetics, it's above all, yes. So it's uh, not only the flow cytometry, it's above all. Uh, you need a bone marrow aspirate to see the cells properly and to send for genetic tests. And then flow cytometry to differentiate what type of uh, acute leukemia that we are dealing with. And cytogenetics and molecular genetics to further define the type as well as to define the treatment. So we need everything. Question six. A 59-year-old woman on a non-vegetarian diet presented with anemic symptoms. Hemoglobin level is 48 grams per liter. She has a history of Hashimoto thyroiditis. And this is her blood picture. Okay. So what is the probable morphological diagnosis? Iron deficiency anemia? Megaloblastic anemia? Aplastic anemia or myelodysplastic syndrome? Right, we'll move on to the next question as well, the second part of it as well. What is the specific diagnostic test you would offer to this patient? Intrinsic factor antibodies. One, right. Parietal cell antibodies. C, 
serum vitamin B12 level, folate, right? So this looks like megaloblastic anemia as most of you correctly answered, because you can see oval macrocytes here, as well as hypersegmented neutrophils. Well, and also a teardrop cell here. Uh, so these changes can occur in myelodysplastic syndrome also, but just looking at these things per se, you can't say it is myelodysplasia because you need to have more evidence, more dysplastic uh, neutrophils, more dysplastic changes, and also possibly a bone marrow biopsy as well. So from the blood picture itself, this is more towards megaloblastic anemia. And if you go back to the history, this is a lady on a non-vegetarian diet. So what is causing the megaloblastic anemia? And this gives us a clue. He, she has a history of Hashimoto thyroiditis. So she has one autoimmune condition. So it gives us a clue that she might have another, isn't it? So what can cause megaloblastic anemia? That is pernicious anemia. The specific test for pernicious anemia would be intrinsic factor antibodies and not the parietal cell antibodies. And serum B12 levels, which is rather labile, we can't actually totally rely upon because it changes. Even when you are deficient with uh, vitamin B12, various factors can cause vitamin B12 levels if you do the levels, it can be normal. So the specific diagnostic test here would be intrinsic factor antibodies. Question seven, a 25 year old man with a history of recurrent transfusions and history of cholecystectomy is being followed up at the hematology clinic. He presents with acute right upper quadrant abdominal pain and hepatomegaly. He was also found to have severe anemia and jaundice. This is the blood picture. And this is his HPLC. So what is the long-standing hematological disease that he has? Homozygous beta thalassemia? HBC disease, E beta, or sickle cell anemia. Yes, so most of you are correct. Here you can see the sickle cells. These type of cells are called sickle cells. Uh, and the HPLC gives us a peak of HBS and HBF, no HBA. So this is sickle cell anemia, homozygous sickle cell disease. What is the most likely cause for his clinical presentation here? So he came with uh, acute abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, severe anemia, and pain. Goldstone in common bile duct, hepatic iron overload, viral hepatitis, or whether this is hepatic sequestration. Yes, it is hepatic sequestration. Because the other things also can be associated with sickle cell anemia, but this is an acute history. He presented acutely with right upper quadrant abdominal pain and hepatomegaly, and is severely anemic. So it is more likely to be hepatic sequestration rather than a goldstone or hepatic iron overload, and there's no fever history also. Right. The question eight is going to be very easy after uh, listening to previous two lectures. This is a 34 year old woman who presents with uh, acute abdominal pain and vomiting. She also complains of passing dark colored urine few days back. On examination, she is pale. Hemoglobin level was 65 grams per liter. There is right hypochondriac tenderness. Abdominal ultrasound plus Doppler revealed hepatic vein thrombosis. She was transfused with two units of blood and direct Coombs test was negative. So what is the likely diagnosis? It's PNH. 
she's got intravascular hemolysis as well as Bajjiari syndrome and the direct Coombs test negative. So it is likely to be paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. So, and what is the confirmatory test? Is it a peripheral blood flow cytometry or HAM test? Yes, it's a peripheral blood flow cytometry because HAM test, we usually use it as a screening test, but the confirmatory test would be flow cytometry. Here you can see the CD59 and CD55 deficient cells are grouped together here. This is the PNH clone and normal red cells. They have CD59 and CD55. So flow cytometry clearly gives us the answer. So that brings to the end of my presentation. I thank uh, the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving us the College of Hematologists this opportunity to, to do the clinical meeting this time. And also we um, thank the Tab Brain Healthcare for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good, uh, what shall I say? Revision of hematology. For me, it's not revision, it is new knowledge, I must say. And uh, it's nice to have these young consultants doing all this work and developing their units. And I can give you some good news. They have guaranteed that they'll be staying in Sri Lanka to serve the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yes. Any question from the audience? I thought they were also answering questions from the... Yeah, he said yes, everyone. Any questions? Who will develop hemolysis? Percentage-wise, I'm not sure. It is known, it is a recognized feature, but I'm not quite sure whether it is common or not. I have not encountered any such patient in my life. Yes. <laughs> any other questions, please? Okay. That's all. Ah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we have received one question from Zoom. It is, what is the place of iron in treatment of PNH since it can worsen hemolysis in PNH? Okay. So, uh, because of ongoing chronic intravascular hemolysis, uh, most patients will develop iron deficiency eventually. And uh, both oral and IV preparations are uh, uh, proven to be effective, but uh, uh, with iron, prep, uh, iron infusions, uh, yes, patient can have exaggerated hemolytic episodes. It's a known complication, uh, which should be treated with uh, immune suppression, the steroids. So we should give iron, uh, if there is exaggerated hemolysis, should be treated with uh, steroids. That's all. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Lunch will be served outside. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have got. Thank you. I got some uh, certificates of association from India.